In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Saint Bonaventure says that there are four ways a person may be prompted toward good and drawn away from evil, namely, by the precepts of a most powerful authority, by the teachings of a most wise truth, by the examples and benefits of a most innocent goodness, and finally, by a combination of these three ways. Such a combination we find in sacred scripture because sacred scripture is the word of God, revealed word of God. And in today's gospel, we have an example of this. We have the account of the second multiplication of loaves and fishes. This miraculous event was a wondrous thing in itself, a clear proof of our Lord's divinity. But the symbolism behind the miracle is no less important. Holy Scripture, besides its literal meaning, in many places can be interpreted in three ways allegorically, morally, and anagogically. Allegory occurs when by one thing is indicated another, which is a matter of belief. The moral understanding occurs when from something done, we learn something else that we should do. The anagogical meaning, a kind of lifting upwards, of course, when we are shown what it is we should desire, that is, the eternal happiness of the blessed. So I will limit myself today to the allegorical meaning of the gospel, of the account of the multiplication of loaves and fishes. First, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes is an evident symbol of the Holy Eucharist. Second, the people following our Lord for three days symbolizes the triple immersion of baptism, or in the present rite, the triple pouring of the baptismal water. Thirdly, according to Saint Gregory the Great, Christ does not wish his followers to be starved of the truth, and the food he gives them is the preaching of the ministers of the church. In summary, by the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, three things are symbolized. Instruction, baptism, and the Holy Eucharist. So let us begin with the Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist is the necessary complement of baptism. Baptism, as we know, gives us a share in Christ's life, but it is necessary for us to perfect and develop this by the constant uh, practice of virtue. And this is where the Holy Eucharist comes in. It enlightens our minds and strengthens our wills. If we wish to say with the apostle, and I live, now not I, but Christ liveth in me, we must seek our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. If we could only draw all its force from this wonderful sacrament, we would be free even from the slightest imperfection. Nevertheless, Father Garrigou Lagrange writes among, that among even daily communicants, we find arrested souls no longer making enough progress and consequently not being called either beginners or proficient or perfect. For a dwarf is neither a perfect child, adolescent or adult. Retarded souls manifest an analogous deviation from the spiritual norm. They are in a state of grace and when they communicate, their communions are not entirely ineffectual really producing in them a slight increase in charity, but a contrary growth 
in venial sins covers over this minimum increase and progress may become slower and slower, like a stone thrown into the air. For Holy Communion to produce its effects in us, we must receive it with the right intentions. For fervent communion, we must have a living faith and that ardent desire called hunger for the Eucharist. If we wonder how it can happen that we do not experience any spiritual hunger for the Eucharist, we ought to remember that doctors advise people who have lost their appetite to take exercise. And the same can be said in regard to our spiritual life. We lack exercise. At least one, one act of mortification a day is a necessity for us. And little by little, we should develop a spirit of sacrifice. It will give, it, give us peace and joy by putting to death our egoism, self-love, and pride, and by making room in our souls for the love of God and of our neighbor. That is the only way we can have this hunger for the Eucharist, when we deny ourselves, when we practice Christian mortification. Now, not only the Eucharist, but also baptism is uh, symbolized in today's gospel. Since our Lord worked the miracle of the multiplication of loaves and fishes after three days, signifying the triple immersion in baptismal waters. Indeed, our spiritual transformation begins at the baptismal font, where our body, or some part thereof, is put under water, just as Christ's body was put under the earth. As St. John Chrysostom says, when we dip our heads under the water, as in a kind of tomb, our old man is buried, and being submerged is hidden below, and thence he rises again anew. If we, we recall today's uh, teaching in the epistle, St. Paul says, know you not that all we who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death? For we are buried together with him by baptism into death, that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So we must understand that the old man, the man of sin in us, must die, so that the new man, that is Christ, may live. Our participation in Christ's death and resurrection, the apostle explains in today's epistle, implies a double obligation. One is negative, and this is death to sin, and the disorders of our passions, and the other is positive, to live the life of Christ and develop it within us. This double obligation comes from the fact that even though we have been baptized, we are still subject to concupiscence, which can lead us into sin. There is within us the conflict of uh, two laws, that of the flesh and that of the spirit. It is the law of the flesh which leads us to do the evil we should not do and omit good that we should like to do. So the only way to be faithful to the baptismal vows is by mortification. Again, the same idea that we saw with the Holy Eucharist for a fruitful reception and daily communion through mortifying ourselves. The same is true here. St. Paul says, always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. So that's the whole essence of the spiritual life, death and life, the death of the old man of sin, the life of Christ and grace. 
Finally, the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes symbolizes instruction, according to St. Gregory. He says, our Lord does not wish to dismiss them fasting, lest they should faint by the way. For it is necessary that men should find in what is preached the word of consolation, lest hungering through want of the food of truth, they sink under the toil of this life. So without the knowledge that is necessary to arrive to heaven, obviously we starve spiritually. We don't have the spiritual food needed. Knowledge of the truth must precede anything else, even the sacraments. Faith comes from hearing, the apostle says. Faith then cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That is why the most important obligation of the minister of Christ is to instruct the people regarding the Catholic faith. Our Lord said, going therefore teach ye all nations. Only then he adds, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. First you need instruction, the preaching of the gospel. St. Paul is even more emphatic. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Very interesting, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Sanctification is impossible without the virtue of faith. The virtue of faith is the supernatural ascent of our intellect to divinely revealed truth. This is why our Lord said, sanctify, sanctify them in truth. There is no way to sanctify ourselves to save our souls without, again, the instruction that is necessary to arrive at the faith. The priestly office is essentially to give sacred things. He offers, the priest offers the holy sacrifice for his own sins and for those of the people. And he gives to the people the word of God and divine mysteries. Our Lord said, peace be to you, as the Father hath sent me, I also send you. This is the mission of the apostles and of the priests and of the bishops, the mission to convert the whole world to Christ, the mission of the church. So uncompromising Catholic priests and bishops continue the divine mission of the church by preaching the truth. St. Paul wants uh, Timothy to always preach the truth. He says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine. For there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth, but will be turned unto fables. The present situation of the church demands of the clergy this, the same kind of zeal that St. Paul expects from Timothy. Today, our priests not only need this zeal and virtue, but also they need a deep knowledge of sacred theology, especially the theology that concerns the church, ecclesiology. And this is in order to guide the faithful during the unprecedented uh, confusion caused by Vatican II. So the faithful will spiritually starve unless they understand that Vatican II is not Roman Catholicism. They will starve if they don't understand that Vatican, the hierarchy of Vatican II does not possess any authority. And that the unacum mass, that is the mass that is offered in communion with Francis, is an intrinsically evil act. And therefore, and to actively participate in the unacum mass is a gravely sinful act. So this is the truth that not everyone wants to hear, but it is the truth. 
I ask myself, dear brethren, brides of St. Augustine, which of these two things has the greater dignity, the word of God or the body of Christ? If you reply truthfully, you will have to say that the word of God does not appear less worthy than the body of Christ. You approach the altar with great care so as not to let fall the body of Christ to the earth hear his preachers with the same care, lest through any fault of yours, his words should fall to the ground, those words which are destined to find place in your hearts. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.